Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. It's early December 2020, and in the United States, we are in the middle of a worsening pandemic. Reported cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. since early March are over 15 million. Total deaths are approaching 300,000, with current daily average deaths exceeding 2,000. Hospitals across the nation are filling up, healthcare staff are being increasingly stressed, and the spike in new cases from Thanksgiving is still on the way. Additional spikes are expected after Christmas and New Year's, so our situation seems set to worsen through at least the end of January. Because of these dire circumstances, I wanted to feature a frontline healthcare professional on this podcast. On this podcast, and with Ava Aronson of Portland, Oregon, I found exactly who I was looking for. Ava's work spans both paid and volunteer capacities. She has experience in critical care and adult ICUs, and currently works in a hospital emergency department. She's also been a street medic at protests for 12 years, volunteers at a syringe exchange, and donates time and expertise to houseless encampments. Ava's social justice angle, as well as her ability to view the U.S. healthcare system with a critical eye, is what makes her such a great fit for this podcast. In our conversation, we've talked about the increasing pressures on the healthcare system, the varying efficacy of different types of masks, life in the emergency department, what COVID tests test and what their limitations are, comparisons to the AIDS epidemic, the negative effects of social distancing, and vaccinations and herd immunity. The topic of vaccinations is particularly controversial and will become more so as they are rolled out over the coming months, so I was pleased to get Ava's point of view. We also talked about her work at current houseless encampments in Portland and as a street medic at the BLM George Floyd protests this year, but I edited out those sections in this recording in order to stay focused on COVID. However, the full interview is available to my Patreon subscribers at patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. I'd also like to acknowledge that this episode was directly inspired by Patrick Farnsworth's Last Born in the Wilderness podcast, which just featured interviews about the pandemic with frontline healthcare workers in Idaho. Check it out at lastborninthewilderness.com. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Ava Aronson. Thanks for joining me tonight, Ava. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to join you, Colibri. Tell us a little bit about what you do for work. And I also was looking through your social media, and I know there's stuff that you do that's outside of work that's also really interesting, but I wanted to start with your job and how that relates. Sure. So for my paid work, I'm a nurse. Um, Up until recently, I worked in critical care, like adult ICUs, and I work in the emergency department, which is something I have some background in through as like an EMT and a lot of community volunteer work. Um, I've also been a a street medic or protest um, safety, you know, whatnot for about 12 years and have done related stuff um, in a lot of like community education. Um, I sometimes teach and supervise nursing students. But I think that um, the friends who tagged me into your discussion topic was because um, I work in the emergency department. I work in a hospital. I think and talk a lot about public health and try to help translate some of like the medical ease and science and things that I've been reading into stuff that the people I communicate with on social media and whatnot will hopefully be meaningful and useful for them. So those are some of the kinds of areas that I work. I also volunteer with and um, a syringe exchange, working with um, people who mostly use um, illicit drugs and also with a lot of houseless folks and houseless encampments. So I kind of do a lot of different varieties of care work, both professionally and um, as political and social justice work, for lack of a better term. Right. That's great. The reason I was hoping to speak to someone who is in your position is that uh, when it comes to COVID, the numbers are, you know, going up. We're in the middle of this wave, which is 
like nothing that we've seen so far this year, you know, nationally or whatever. And we're not, we haven't even seen, uh, you know, necessarily seen the spike from Thanksgiving yet, you know? And then I, I'm sure that there'll be a spike from Christmas and, and, and New Year's as well. And so, uh, a lot of us who have been watching this and are, you know, taking it seriously, um, uh, have a, a, a real sense of foreboding. And that's related, uh, not just to, the number of people who are going to get, you know, who are going to get sick and who are going to suffer, but also uh, looking at the healthcare system and wondering, just being very concerned about that too, you know, being concerned that it's going to uh, buckle under the pressure. And so I was hoping that you might be able to give me some of your perspectives from, uh, from, from the inside, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that that fear is very real and very uh, realistic. Um, I will first say that my experience as an emergency nurse and former ICU nurse in Portland, Oregon, um, is very different from that of the experiences of people in, for example, New York City uh, or New Orleans or folks working on reservations or in Chicago or areas which, um, or, or pretty much anywhere in Texas, which have been very, very heavily impacted by COVID earlier in the pandemic. Um, I will say that in Portland, we've been very fortunate on a couple of axes, partly that the, that the pandemic came here a little bit later, that we shut down the state early, um, kind of just in the nick of time, and that in general, enough people have taken enough precautions long enough that uh, we didn't experience really a first surge in the way that many other parts of the country did. Um, at this point, we are definitely experiencing a surge. Uh, we experienced some smaller versions, you know, after uh, various other, you know, uh, celebratory weekends, July 4th, Memorial Day, et cetera. Um, but none of them is in any way comparable to what we're experiencing now. And what we're experiencing in Portland is not yet thankfully comparable to what a lot of other areas are experiencing, like North Dakota, where one in 800 people are currently dead um, from COVID. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. So that's not, um, thankfully, the situation here, but um, but it, it, it's very concrete and measurable. Like the number of people in the hospital with COVID is, easily five times what it was like a couple weeks ago um, wow. both hospital wide and within the ICU um, we've now for the first time spread outside of the designated space we had set for COVID patients and are now allocating other units for COVID um, uh, we've again shut down voluntary surgeries <clears throat> um, I mean, everything is just as ordered by, like, the Oregon Health Asso um, Association. Um, visitations have been reduced. Um, so it's, I mean, it's getting bad. Um, there's a lot of people coming into the hospital with COVID or potentially COVID-like symptoms. Patients are very scared. Family members are very scared. Um, staff are scared. Um Thankfully, we're like I said, we're not at total crisis. We're we're not at, um, you know, backed up morgues that badly. Um, hospital systems kind of by design exist at the edge of emergency because that's the only way they make money. Um, and there's costs and benefits of running them that way just as there are many costs associated with capitalism and there are a couple of rare benefits um, for some people so um, the hospitals and all of the healthcare workers and all of the community are you know are uh, are trying to deal with it as you know with the crisis as it continues to develop and it's um, I won't lie, it's scary. I um, I've gotten tested a you know a few times this this year with like various kinds of potential healthcare scares. Um, COVID is unfortunately a very uh, confusing illness. Um, there's certain things that conform to past patterns of other kinds of diseases that are similar, and there's other things that appear to be pretty different. And so it becomes really hard because there is so much uh, 
pre-symptomatic and more or less asymptomatic transmission that appears to happen. Um, that you know, it's we don't want to negatively impact um, others. Like I have a partner. I live in a house collective household. I work with. Um, both professionally and as a volunteer, a lot of people who experience vulnerabilities um, of health and social circumstance, and I don't want to get them sick. Um, and so um, that's been on my mind a lot. And as um, as like the potential promises of, uh, or not potential, as the promises of vaccines come to be nearer, that's definitely been a thing on my mind a lot because it's really, really important to me that I don't kill my friends or my friends' family members or my patients or their family members. And that's a very real possibility with this disease. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, I wanted to ask, have you, has there been in, at the situation, we've, we've heard horror stories from around the country about uh, people working in hospitals not having the right, not having enough um, uh, safety equipment, not enough masks or anything like that. Has that been the situation where you've been? Um, it depends at what moments. There were some moments early in the pandemic when they were talking about having hospital staff wear cloth masks. Um, and that was really deeply concerning to me because uh, while cloth masks are an effective tool for limiting spread, it's not a effective protective tool. Um, thankfully, they were able to secure enough, um, a variety of masks to get them on staff. Um how much is enough protection is as we all kind of know a little bit of a moving target because um, this is an emerging illness with that appears to behave in a couple of different ways. So um, what is adequate protection for a particular condition changes over time. Uh, and so my, the PPE that I wear at this point is an N95 mask covered by um, a surgical mask. And then I change out the surgical mask. Um, at least daily, and I change out the N95 mask when it gets dirty or when I feel like I need to. Um, and thankfully, right now, I have access to those tools. Um, I definitely have some anxiety that that might not always be the case, and I have backup plans in place for myself so that um, I can take care of myself and then continue to take care of my patients and, and uh, my people that I put at risk by being amongst them. Um, but yeah, so for the moment, not at that level of crisis, um, but definitely a concern. What's the basic difference between the N95 and the cloth mask? Is it basically that the first one protects you better and the cloth mask protects others better? So, I mean, there's a, there's a broad variety of protective equipment that will protect your airway and respiratory tract, which seems to be the predominant mechanism of infection for COVID. Um, there's a lot of questions that remain. Um, there is a kind of a, like not all cloth masks are the same. There's data that's emerging about how some cloth masks um, prevent spread better than others. Some protect the wearer better than others. Um, the general parameters are that like a surgical mask, um, I would also throw in the mix, um, prevents most of outward transmission and most of inward transmission. Okay. Um, we're talking about transmission of a virus um, that appears to aerosolize the way that COVID does. Um, both of those are relevant. Um, when you are wearing a mask um, that has some benefits and some costs. The biggest cost is that it can make us um, feel safe when in fact we might not be. Um, and so one of the, some of the biggest things we can do are keeping distance from people, limiting exposure in the community, um, sanitizing our hands frequently, and just trying to minimize exposure to other people and to ourselves. Um, masks are helpful for that. Um, cloth, surgical, or any others in that um, they reduce the amount of droplets and micro droplets and aerosols that go into the environment and reduce the amount that go into us when we breathe in. Um, when you are obligated to be in close proximity with somebody, such as a healthcare worker, such as 
any number of service industry people who are not able to get out of work right now because um, in capitalist societies, we value commerce more than we do lives. Um, then you really want something that is going to be able to protect the wearer because they don't really have a choice of whether they can keep distance. So in that situation, I would encourage people to have a minimum of a surgical mask, which which appears to reduce droplets and aerosols um, somewhere in like the 80 to 90 percent range, as high as maybe, yeah, basically around in there, which is a pretty darn good protection. Cloth masks usually are somewhere in the 40 to 50 percent reduction, so significant, but not adequate to really protect the wearer. But like on a cultural level, if everybody's wearing at least a cloth mask, it cuts down the transmission on both ends. N95s are designed to um, protect against, as the name would suggest, about 95% of particles, uh, which is not perfect, but is pretty darn good. Um, there are other protective equipment like um, P100 masks, uh, or respirators rather, which usually have filters um, on them and are um, sometimes in combination with other kinds of chemical obstructing filters, the kinds of a lot of, of equipment that a lot of uh, protesters were obligated to wear because of the amount of gas and pepper spray and other things that they were exposed to, that we were exposed to this summer. Um, so there's really a whole range. And I, I usually, when I'm talking with people about mask wearing, um, encourage them first to wear any mask because any mask is probably better than no mask. Um, as long as you're being thoughtful about cleaning your hands before and after you wear it and either washing it or replacing it frequently enough. Um, and then I would think about what is realistic your, your level of exposure and your obligatory exposure because the ideal is that we minimize our exposure, but when you can't, you want to wear the protection that is proportionate to your risk. And so for anyone working in a healthcare field where they're working with sick people, um, I think you should have the best protection that you can have. And when um, there's a lot of politics and science that's trying to work out what that looks like, um, which I think is maybe more than I want to go into here. Um, but I would say um, when early on in the pandemic, they were saying, oh, don't run on masks. I think that was an understandable choice because we didn't have enough for healthcare workers. And I really do believe not on a selfish basis that like healthcare workers need to have priority when it comes to protective equipment. That said, I think we all need protective equipment and lacking enough um, self-protective masks. I think we need to have enough of all kinds of masks. I'm, I'm really grateful for cloth masking programs and like sew your own mask programs is, is to like really um, support the community and taking the steps that we need to do to protect others. Because fundamentally that's like what public health is, is it's like, how can we support everybody? And so when we all wear masks, we're all protecting each other. Um, certainly if you're in a position that you have to interact with unmasked people, you should have the best masks available because you're at real risk. Right. Which is why I really feel for a lot of my uh, retail uh, community. Like I used to work in retail and food service and there are some really thoughtless and um, unempathetic and unsympathetic people out there um, putting them at risk. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've been hearing the stories and, and yeah, we don't have to get into that here today, but it, yeah, it's terrible. Um, I also wanted to ask you about, um, I have a friend who's a nurse in Alberta and they're having um, a spike in Canada right now as well, uh, more than they have earlier in the year. And there they've uh, been forced to um, change the ratio of nurses to patients. Uh, and basically they're now doubling the number of patients that each each nurse has, is, is responsible for on a shift. I'm wondering if you're seeing that kind of thing where you're at yet. Um, not currently in my workplace. I do work in a union job that offers a degree of protection. Um, the pandemic is worsening in Oregon, but at my employer, we are not yet in that position. I am aware of nurses who are put in that position even in non-crisis times. Um, and in this crisis time, we're definitely in that position. Um, and that's, you know, very concerning for me as a nurse and for my safety and protection of my license. And it's also concerning for me as a human being and who wants um, patients, minor other people's to get the best care that they can. Um, 
unfortunately, um, lack of support for nurses um, and sometimes like violent aggression against nurses or uh, violent lack of uh, providing um, adequate protection for nurses uh, makes nurses not want to work. Um, and nurses are susceptible to illness like anyone else. And the number of patients is just enormous. And the, like the healthcare system is just not prepared to support that. Um, again, largely because of capitalism. Um, and so, yeah, there are nurses having to provide inadequate care to lots of patients because that's the best they can do. And I feel for them. Right, right. And where you are is in emergency, you said. Yeah, I work in the emergency department. Um, in many ways, that's a scarier place than in the ICU because it's defined by a lack of control. Every People just come in and you, we we have to support them. And uh, we want to figure out, you know, how can we get you out of the emergency department as soon as possible, if at all possible? And if you are too ill to leave the hospital, how can we keep you and the people around you safe? Um, and that's kind of what I do. Right. Um so obviously, you're definitely you're definitely seeing a lot of people who um, are expressing COVID symptoms who are happy to show up there. Absolutely, the number is is pretty significant. It's not everybody, um, but there's part of the nature of this illness is that anybody could have this, regardless of whether they have COVID symptoms. So it definitely ups kind of the any at any given time. But there's definitely plenty of people who come through and like, yep, you have COVID, and we're also seeing a lot of folks who have had who have been diagnosed with COVID um, who are now coming into the hospital because they're getting sicker um, because part of the natural history of this disease is people start out being asymptomatic, they transmit the virus, then they get sick, then they maybe start to isolate, hopefully, if they have a conscience or and if they're able. Um, and then some of them get worse and then they have to come into the hospital and we have to try to keep them alive. Right, right. Are you doing... Uh, I mean, so I assume you're doing lots of testing then. Yep, doing lots of testing. Thankfully, um, testing has become more available. Um, I wish that um, the United States had invested more resources into testing more people early on. I think there's a lot of things we could discuss politically about what went wrong and why the United States is currently the worst hotbed of coronavirus in the world. Um, and at this point, I'm grateful that we have more or less enough tests to test all the people who need to be tested. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty proficient uh, nasopharyngeal swapper at this point. <laughs> right. Cause there's, there's a, there's more than one kind of test. And one of them is putting a, a swab like through someone's nose into the back of their throat. Right. Which. That's correct. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, there are different tests. None of the tests are a hundred percent. And even if they were, um, it's not, even if they were 100% accurate, it would not be a reliable way of saying that you were safe. But this is one of the things that's really hard, to, I think, to convey to people is because we want to connect with our families, with our friends, with our lovers, with our community. And people think, understandably, well, okay, if I get tested and I test negative, then I'm safe. Unfortunately, it's not that case. Um, well, that's a I would regard that as a harm reduction strategy because it does reduce harm if you can reduce the likelihood that you have coronavirus. The best tests that we have, which are a well-done nasopharyngeal swab, um, at best are probably 70 to 80 percent accurate, which means that maybe two to three people out of 10 who get swabbed and show negative will actually have the virus. Um, there are other swabs, most of the ones that are available in community, like a nasal swab. That's the one that doesn't hurt as much because it's just swabbing the inside of your nares of your nose. Um, that it's again all of this data is hard to know because you can't know we don't have a, a, a really solid comparison that may be as high as 50 percent false negatives wow. which means that on a personal level it has zero value because 50 percent inaccurate means that it's equally possible that it's right and wrong right um on a cult on like a community one on a public health level it's still very useful and i've participated in swabbing drives where we've done it because you still have a chance of picking up on some positive cases, but it's not a reliable tool for minimizing the risk to others. Um, so I fully support people getting tested and using that as additional information, but not assuming that a negative result means that you're safe 
and that you are not going to communicate, transmit the virus to someone you love. Um, because that's just not what that means. And unfortunately, neither do um, the antibody tests that we have. Those are also somewhat unreliable, although I know less about the data about that because there was a lot of different tests that were generated. Um, and I expect that the value and accuracy of those tests will vary from person to person, from like a bit, from a test to test. So I, w- I would discuss, if you want to engage with that testing, I would encourage discussing with your healthcare provider who orders it. Right. But yeah, so it makes it complicated. I mean, it's super tricky too, because like the obviously uh, the transmission is, you know, invisible, can happen without you knowing it. So you can go and, and we can, you know, let's say you go, you get a test, you're one of the people where it actually accurately told you that you actually didn't have it. And then you're exposed, you know, on the way home or something like that. I mean, it's much different than like, say, um, I'm, I'm old enough that, um, uh, I, I, you know, went through the AIDS scare. And so mm-hmm. like in the early nineties, you know, I was spending lots of time in, in, in gay bars and stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, at that time, that was just that the specter of that one was, was very large. It was right there, you know, like, sure. you know, uh, that, that was a big thing, you know, and in those days, you know, you'd, you'd go to get an HIV test and you had to wait like 10 days, you know, to get the result, you know, and, and you know, as you can imagine, that was a very long 10 days, you know, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? But at the same time, we knew what risky behavior was. We knew what, you know what I mean? Like, not initially, but like, well, I mean, you knew if you, yeah. you, we knew if you didn't have sex with anybody, you know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, totally. like, like it was that easy. And in, in that, yeah. like, okay, I, I, I've been tested. I'm negative. I haven't been with anyone since that test that I got three months ago or whatever. So you could really say, yeah, I'm clean, you know? For sure. Uh, but that's just yeah, not, it's definitely not that simple here. No. And it, mm-hmm. it's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've had a lot of experience talking with people as like a non-monogamous person and as a person in community of queer and trans people. Um, generally, like, you know, like conversations about STIs are a thing that we have as people who engage in like sexual activities. And this conversation in many ways is like having an STI conversation as like a non-monogamous person, except that you also have to have it with the people you don't sleep with. Um, like the people you're around and you have to think about how does the people that they, that my lovers and friends and other people live with. And it's, um, yeah, it's a lot of very difficult risk stratification, uh, and risk analysis. And it's like, as much as I think about this stuff, it's very challenging for me. Um, and I, I remember early in the pandemic, I got to this point where I was like, I felt very important to me that, that I answer people's questions like, is this safe? I would say no. Like pretty much nothing we do is safe. There is no safety with this illness. There is risk reduction. So I was like, you know, like this one friend and their housemate, I will hug. And that's a higher degree of risk, but it's still not that much risk comparatively to like if we kissed, which I would like. Um, so it's like that kind of navigation. Um, but then like, I also have to have that conversation with my housemates. Like, are you, how do you feel about me doing this? Also, I'm working in these high risk spaces and like, how are my risks affecting other people? And so I think that it's important that we be honest with ourselves about the risks that we're ready to take on, not just for ourselves, but for the people that we interact with and care about and for their family members. Um, I know that there is, like outside my community and I can't imagine doing this but there was a like a 300 person wedding situation that killed 10 people who right. weren't even at the wedding mm-hmm. because it caused it it was a super spreader event that ended up contributing to a whole bunch of people transmitting the virus to their family members some of whom experienced um, chronic illnesses or were older um, and so it's like that kind of risks that we take on not just for ourselves, but for other people. That really is, I think, one of the hardest things about this disease. Yeah, I think that, you know, this is going to end up having um, some long-term effects as well uh, in the same way that the AIDS epidemic had some long-term effects because the whole whole practice of, you know, having frank conversations with, you know – um, with someone about your sexual history, well, that dates back to the, to that time. You know, that's when 
it became necessary to do that and to be like, okay, uh, I need to put my ego concerns aside. I need to put my little jealousy feeling. I don't I have to not, I have to not worry about making someone feeling jealous because I'm telling them about my exes because we have to talk about my exes. They have mm-hmm. to talk about their exes. Like that really mm-hmm. changed, uh, communication around sex. I mean, obviously yeah. most especially within the gay community, but I think that it also, uh, uh, moved out of that a little bit, you know, in, into the, into the straight community too. And oh, it's, and it's really? still, it's still with us. And I also have noticed, um, you know, uh, uh, friends of mine who are queer or who are, or who are in the gay community, um, not, not, not universally, but for the most part have been, uh, a much more of, uh, uh quick learners, you know, yeah. when it comes to this situation of being like, Oh, okay. I have to take precautions. We oh, can't I have to hide right away. And we stopped gay dance parties which let me tell you is really hard <laughs> right <laughs> right <laughs> i it's yeah it's um i i really feel for myself but i especially feel for like a lot of young people who like opportunities for connection and socialization and community like are just have like vanished at sometimes really key moments in yeah. like development and socialization as people and as queer people um i feel for my students like, I can't imagine spending seven hours on a computer every day of class and then spending hours more of studying. Like, that's just crazy making. Like, yeah, that's terrible. This, this is definitely a deep, like, even for those of us who are not physically harmed by coronavirus, which I think will be some of us, thankfully, um, all of us are going to carry trauma away from this. And that's, that's just how it is, you know, um, and hopefully we can reduce that trauma. Uh, but it doesn't seem like we've done a terribly good job thus far in the United States. And I'm, I'm worried for what these next couple of months are going to look like. Oh, I mean, definitely. And, you know, of course, the way that the um, the way that this virus is affecting uh, people who affecting the health system, affecting people who don't have it, of course, is a big deal, too, because, mm-hmm. you know, the fact now that, you know, People can't come and visit people, family members or friends of theirs in the hospital very easily is is a big deal. You know, this wasn't I mean and, and still is. I mean like Absolutely. this th- this is Absolutely. where we could yeah, this is where we could start to get into the politics of it and compare to other countries because other countries had a first wave, you know, like some place like France had like a pretty serious lockdown and then they were able to get to some semblance of normal, you know. Uh, uh, later on in the summer, and I guess that they're locked down now, but they had yeah. very different experiences there than we have here. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of layers. I think um, certainly a degree of um, there's a lot of reasons why people disregard public health guidelines. In this country, part of that is because the leadership disregarded the public health guidelines, which makes it really confusing for other people. I don't believe in the state, but while we have one, it's really nice when it looks out for people's survival. That's how I feel Uh, about it. Yeah. But also I think that there's also human behavior. Like I was reading about um, the start of the word quarantine, which comes from um, uh, Italian for 40 days. Um, And that was just an arbitrary amount of time that back in like the plague in like plague times that they were like, well, we're just going to have people isolate for that amount of time. And it turns out that when we study human behavior, that people can put up with ignoring our impulses and our inclinations for about that amount of time before we just experience like decision fatigue and go about our business. And so like, I think part of it is that too, that just like at a certain point people are like, okay, I'm done. And I, I get that because I feel done. But also, again, I don't want to kill people I care about. Um, so I think that, I mean, this winter is going to be bad for much of the world, but it's extra bad here because it's been so bad and because um, the sub- the infrastructure and the support has been so poor in general. Um, and that's no offense to like really hardworking public health workers and healthcare professionals and like really dedicated people of all in all communities who've been really giving themselves to this um, to trying to like minimize the harm. But there's been a lot like part of the nature of it is it's just fundamentally unfair. A few people can do more harm than hundreds of people can minimize harm, unfortunately. 
So, yeah, I, and that's, I guess, kind of, if it's all right with you, I'd love to talk for a couple minutes about vaccinations. Yeah, stuff. let's do it. I want, I had that on my list, actually. Mm-hmm. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... Like, it's not a decision that a lot of people are going to get to act on immediately because, um, you know, we're still... There's still some development happening. There's a lot of discussion regarding production and distribution, which for the two vaccines that we currently are aware of and that are probably going to get licensed within the next couple weeks. Um, They have pretty specific guidelines for how they can be distributed because um, like the Pfizer vaccine specifically is not remotely stable unless at like super cold temperatures, the Moderna one, which seems to have similar levels of efficacy is also, it's more stable and more easily distributed than the Pfizer one, but it's also going to have barriers. And then we're waiting for final data on the AstraZeneca one, which is the next one in the lineup. It doesn't appear to be as effective, maybe, at least in the first set of trials. But there were some gaps there that they're trying to make up for now. So hopefully we'll have better and clearer data soon. Um, that one would it have the benefit of being easier to distribute and having less specific storage parameters. But there's definitely going to be a big, there's a huge amount of work and logistics that's going to go into distributing these vaccines. Um, And part of what I think maybe even led to some of the people tagging me on your question was because I've been writing about vaccines a lot Mm, um, lately. And part of that has been because there's a lot of fear and distrust. And um, I first of all want to say that it is absolutely understandable that especially people who um, have been subject to um, generation after generation of violence sometimes done by healthcare workers should be distrustful of the healthcare industry. And I'm speaking specifically about black and indigenous people, queer people I can understand because we have a long history of being abused um, by healthcare workers. Um, I see it less. I'm also uh, Jewish and I see that less in our community, but like that's also um, there's histories of medical experimentation on Jewish people um, in the show off. So like, I get why there's a lot of anxiety about that, but a lot of it is really disproportionate and I think brought on by like a misreading of anti-government and or anti-corporate power. I think it's always appropriate to question the government, always appropriate to question corporations. Um, However, um, while I think about the world and healthcare in a lot of different ways, my training is fundamentally from Western biomedical position and Part of that means looking at data to support things. There's plenty of things the Western biomedical system does that is not data driven, not based on evidence. So I don't say that people should trust healthcare workers and corporations and the government just because I think it's reasonable to question. However, um, I do think that insofar as we can know anything, we have to look to evidence. And currently the evidence for the vaccines that or on the verge of likely approval seems to be pretty unqualifiedly good. Um, I am fundamentally don't believe in anything or absolutes, <clears throat> but insofar as we can trust information that exists in the world, the information that exists about these vaccines points to them being effective points to them being safe. Uh, <clears throat> effective doesn't mean that they will uh, unqualifiedly prevent somebody from getting COVID, but they do point that somewhere in the 90 to 95% reduction of risk level, which when it comes to a public health level, that would have a truly monumental impact if we can get a significant percentage of the population vaccinated, that could stop this disease cold. Right. Unfortunately, I don't think that enough people in the U.S. are going to get vaccinated in short enough of a time to um, save as many lives as I would like to. Uh, <clears throat> but for my own personal safety and for the safety around of people around me, 
and for the safety of a lot of marginalized and at-risk people, I really, really encourage that any time that somebody becomes able to access a vaccine that they do so because that will be having multiple layers of benefit for you, for the people you interact with, for the people they interact with, and so on. Um, so right. I'm I'm very eager to get vaccinated as soon as that's an option. Right. Yeah, I, I would. I, I'll just say something to that skepticism, Please. you know, for a moment too, and, and give you a, a chance to get a drink of water here. And and um, you know, I, I'll say that you know, some of my own skepticism goes back, you know, over you know about about government and regulatory agencies and all that, you know, from the last you know twenty twenty five years of sort of awareness of how you know, regulatory agencies of the of the government are captured by the industries that they're supposed to be regulating, you know, knowing that, you know, um, uh, uh, parts of the government that are involved with approving medication, you know, are, are you know, um, uh, subject to, to politics, etc. And so that's been where the main source of my skepticism, um, I, I, that, that's kind of where I've gone first when I'm like, Oh, hmm. So, so we've got this capitalist system. We've got a for-profit company making this thing, sort of rushing it out there quick, and then a regulatory agency or apparatus that I don't always trust. I'm like, okay, I'm sort of identifying that as my own uh, most critical part here, you know. Um, and I also, you know, I used to live in Portland. I knew a lot of people uh, who were, um, uh, in general, very skeptical of. Of Western medicine, and I understand some of that too, uh, given some of the the history and the things that have happened, you know, as well. And so I thought it was interesting recently when I've been doing some research about vaccines to see that well, vaccines and inoculation don't actually come from Western medicine first. They were pra- it was practiced first by the Chinese um, uh, at least a thousand years ago. And also was practiced, uh, in African folk medicine, uh, for centuries and centuries and centuries. And I just learned today that the first, uh, inoculations against smallpox that took place in the American colonies in Boston in the early 1700s, uh, were done by, uh, Cotton Mather, who's a, a famous, you know, person from that period, who learned about inoculations from the enslaved person that he kept, who had been a gift to him from someone else, who described the methods of inoculation that they used traditionally in Africa. And that not only that, but that uh, people in the African diaspora that occurred because of slavery were practicing inoculation all over the world in the different places that they were based on their former, their former, um, you know, what they, what they'd done in their, in their homelands. And so I looked at that and I thought, huh, that's very interesting. And I wonder how people who are skeptical of Western medicine will feel to find out that actually vaccinations have their source other places, including with Chinese medicine, which is very well respected in alternative circles. Yeah, I think that those are some great points. It's certain that um, most medicines that exist in uh, the Western biomedical like pharmacopoeia have roots elsewhere um i would add a couple things to that which is um a lot of the abuses practiced by um like the um, pharmaco- pharmaceutical industry in the united states and sometimes permitted by regulatory agencies um have much poorer evidence than do vaccines um For example, while I firmly support people utilizing the medicines that help their bodies and brains work well, I would never defend unqualifiedly, for example, psychopharmaceuticals, because while they work wonders for individuals on a like public health level, on like an evidence based level, it just many of them just don't bear out, especially things like antidepressants. Some of them do, some of them don't. But as as a whole, it's it's pretty variable. Yeah, vaccines some... are kind of vaccines are kind of different in that right. there's like a different level of evidence that's kind of required because if you think about it, it's the one area where we have to document that getting it is safer than not getting it, versus uh... that getting it is that getting it for disease X is better than continuing to have that disease. This is something where 
your safety has to be improved by getting the vaccine. Um, the risks from most vaccinations, although there's um, a lot of what I would regard as misinformation characterizing um, vaccinations, the major risks are several. One of them is allergic reaction, which some people have allergic reactions to vaccines um, or to vaccine components. Usually that can be addressed and those people can still get the vaccine regard if they can get um, something to, to, you know, to lessen their reaction. But that is a real and understandable, sometimes contraindication or precaution that's needed. Um, there are some people whose immune systems react very poorly to exposure to substances. Um, and unfortunately, it's really hard to sometimes sort out whether someone who, for example, experiences an immune overreaction to a vaccine would have experienced that same immune react overreaction to another illness. Beca but um, when I've looked at the data, for example, one of the common ones is Guillain-Barre. Um, there's also, um, there's a, a lot of publicity around um, a spike in narcolepsy that happened in a certain population of people that received the H1N1 vaccine in Europe. But when you look at it, the rates of narcolepsy and the rates of um, Guillain-Barre, <clears throat> which are both sometimes triggered by immune reactions, are far, far higher in the general population in those areas than they are in the people who got the vaccines. So it's not to say that like those vaccines might not have triggered those reactions because they probably did at the point that you're seeing a bunch of people getting sick at roughly the same time with the same condition given that like, but what's unclear is, is like whether they would have had that reaction without that. That said, when you compare the numbers of, for example, like a few tenths of a percent of people who are exposed to an illness versus the like 50 percent reduction in like childhood and infant mortality produced by vaccinations. To me, while I can appreciate people's anxiety about it, I just can't hold with the, the anti-vax position, which to me is, is fundamentally like individualist. And I think that's that's also that individualism kind of criteria is part of what is behind the explosion of coronavirus in the United States. People believe that people can do whatever they want because it's their own life. And like, I get that, except that it's, it's never just your own life when it comes to an infectious disease. It's always that of the people around us. Um, and so with this particular vaccine or the vac the constellation of vaccines we're looking at, it does appear that mo that many people have an immune reaction. Um, a lot of people get a flu vaccine and will feel kind of a little bit under the weather for a day. That's because part of what you want is your immune system to react to the vaccine and generate immunity. Um, that's it. There's nothing like specially chemical about it. It's just that's how your immune system develops immunity. Um, with this virus, because um, it's appeared that some people who got lighter cases of coronavirus did not develop complete immunity or enduring immunity. Um, we have to make sure that we have an immune response that's significant enough to generate that immunity. And so it appears that more people on average have that feeling under the weather, maybe a little bit of chills, maybe a, um, feeling fatigue or achy. And for like a little bit longer, sometimes as many as a couple days. Um, obviously, not all of our bodies re respond to the same to different immune stimuli. And so there's some people who will not qualify for this vaccine, just as there are some people who do not qualify for other vaccines because their immune system is too weakened, such as we were just talking about HIV, a chronic condition of immunosuppression is that sometimes people can't really qualify for a vaccine because they, their body just will not mount the appropriate response. Um, that said, as a person, even with like a couple of chronic conditions of my own, the idea of having a sore arm and or feeling a little bit under the weather for a couple of days and in trade for that, being at a significantly reduced risk of killing someone I care about or killing somebody that someone I care about cares about is like, it, it, there's not even a discussion. Right. Um, and I, I think that most people, when they think about it in those terms and when they understand like what a what a reaction means can get with that. And I've had a lot of friends who be who like understandably have frustration with the Western biomedical healthcare system who are like, 
I feel angry when healthcare workers tell me that these are not real side effects. And I agree that it's, it's shitty and crummy whenever someone in a position of power tells you that your experience is not real. So that's, that people shouldn't do that. But I think it's also important that people understand that sometimes we're using different terms. <clears throat> um, like if I think about an adverse effect or an effect that shouldn't happen, that I don't want to happen with a with an, uh, a medication or with an herb or with whatever it is, a food, um, that's something that I don't expect happening with that versus their anticipated effects. Like I anticipate that a vaccine will cause an immune reaction because that is its purpose. Ah, good point. Um, so if you get a vaccine and you feel, especially this vaccine, and you feel a little bit poorly after it, that's a good sign. Um, still be cautious because you can always get coronavirus and get vaccinated and then get sick because it takes a while for your immune system to develop a response. So, you know, you're not safe automatically. But if you get the vaccine and then for the next day or two, you feel under the weather and it gets better, there's it's almost certainly the vaccine and not the coronavirus. That said, if you get sick for a couple of weeks, um, you should get tested because there's a good chance you've been exposed to coronavirus. Right. Um, and so I think that that's the thing. Now, that's not to say that people can't have adverse reactions to vaccines. That's why we have adverse reaction reporting systems. Most of the reports to the vaccine reporting systems don't appear to have anything to do with the vaccine. People will be like, oh, they had they got hit by a car or something. You're like, that's that's clearly terrible and horrifying. And it also has zero things to do with the vaccine. Um I think that, again, the big thing I would point to is like, what are the things that we can do to take care of ourselves? What are the things that we can do to take care of our friends and family and community? And what are the things that we can do to take care of society, for lack of a better word? And on pretty much all of those counts, uh, with the exception of like a very, very, very small number of people, a vaccine dings all three of those categories. Um, And, you know, the other thing I would just say is that for people who are really dubious and scared, like most of those people, unless they're healthcare workers, it's going to be or um, people with very hot, significant risk factors, such as elders with chronic illnesses um, like diabetes or uh, coronary artery disease are probably going to have a little bit of time of watching and seeing how other people do with these vaccines. And I guess the last piece I would just address is the idea that it's been rushed. Um, it doesn't appear that any part of the studies to assess the effectiveness of these vaccines has been rushed. What's been rushed is, is that they've used technologies to develop the vaccine faster than have many others. So it's like there's usually a large, long, long, long gap wherein they do all kinds of research, experiments on animals and things like that that I don't love. Um, in this vaccination program, there I'm sure that there were things I don't love that took place. Um, at this, but the things that have been going on for the last eight months have been studying and seeing how the people who got these vaccines handled it. And really in the last month, uh, like last month or two, as, um, the, as the pandemic has picked up again on like a global and definitely domestic level, the data has been pretty conclusive. And, um, the people that I look to for healthcare guidance and, the things that I look for when I look for a medicine or a medical intervention that has strong evidence all point to these being strong evidence. And so I feel zero qualms about getting this vaccine as soon as possible. I would sign up for a trial, except, and I actually have, but my hope is actually just to get a vaccine that's already documented because um, I need, again, to not make my patients sick, not make my partner or household sick, not make the people I care for in community sick. Um, and so I feel like that's my responsibility. And I hope that people will figure out their levels of responsibility to themselves, to their community, and act on that appropriately. Can you say something about herd immunity <laughs> really quickly? Because that's actually related. Sure. And I believe that term has been really mm-hmm. misunderstood this year. I think that's a great question. So um, I listen, I'm a big podcast listener. Um, one of my favorite podcasts. Um, for a lot of healthcare stuff, I feel com- complicated about because they're part of the skeptic community, and it's uh, it's called Sawbones, and they talk about a lot of medical inf- misinformation 
So it might not resonate with everybody because a lot of the time their medical misinformation is stuff that I'm like, no, this is good medicine. It's just not from my tradition of medicine. Mm -hmm. But they also do some really good education about medical history, including some of its like racist and other roots. Um, The concept of herd immunity comes from observations that have happened with um, herds of animals that humans raise for food or for other purposes. Um, and that when an illness went through that herd for a while, they would kill off um, <clears throat> the animals that got sick. And they found that that didn't usually work for preserving the health of that herd. Uh, eventually, what they found is, is that if they allow those animals to live and hopefully survive, then um, over time, those illness, that illness didn't recur within that herd because enough of the animals had immunity to the disease, whether because they'd gotten it ill themselves or whether they'd gotten exposed and fought off the disease, that over time there was hardly any animals that were susceptible to that illness. Um, for those of you who aren't f- familiar, the things that a disease needs to take to get in order to take root, an infectious disease needs to get into a human and infect them, is um, it needs to be present, like... Uh, you can't get HIV if there's no HIV present, for example. Um, you could get stabbed by a million needles, and if there's no hepatitis C on those needles, you will not get hepatitis C. Right. Although, by the way, hardly anyone gets hepatitis C from an accidental needle stick. So you need to have the disease, the infectious thing present. You need to have a way for it to get into your body, which unfortunately coronavirus has at least a couple, definitely your airway, possibly your eyes, and possibly your GI tract or gastrointestinal tract. Um, <clears throat> please cover your noses as well as your mouths because it looks like it can get into your brain through your nose. Um, and then it also needs susceptibility. So if the person is not susceptible, it won't make you sick. It could get on you, but you can't transmit it in most cases because there's just not enough of that viral particle or bacteria or, wet or fungus to make you sick. So it won't, it won't get onto other people and make them sick. So the idea of herd immunity is then transferred to human population. The idea is that if, if enough people in a community are immune to a disease, then um, even those people who don't have immunity to like specifically will be protected by the herd. Calling humans herd animals is a little bit complicated, especially um, if you're not white, um, because there's a long history of associating um, black, indigenous and people of color, as well as women and other people with animals, which is both fine because humans are animals, but also terrible because it's dehumanizing and stigmatizing and racist. Um, But also it doesn't always transfer so well because um, the idea is first off that it's okay that some people get sick and die. Um, if you're assuming that the way that you get herd immunity is just by some people getting sick, it also assumes that people are self-contained, which we're not. So in a herd, the animals stay together because, um, we have fences and electric prods and other things to control the animals. Humans, thankfully in general, unless you're talking about incarcerated persons or people subject to colonialism, um, are not usually contained in that way. So, um, that logic doesn't work on its own. The only way that logically and like realistically a, a community can develop herd immunity is in a way that's like at all ethical is really through a vaccination program. Because, for example, measles, most heavily studied medication in existence is the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And that's because along the way, some guy, in order to get cred, misrepresented his data and suggested that the MMR vaccine causes autism. Dr. Wakefield is who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not caused by a vaccine. It's definitely not caused by that vaccine. There's a, I'll, I'll just insert there that there's a great yeah, podcast on um, uh, Behind the Bastards uh, about, oh, yeah. about Dr. Wakefield and that whole situation. I listened to it the other day. I'm like, oh, that's where the whole story came from. And I found yeah, that to it's, be... It's super wild. Yeah, it was really incredible. That guy was a real grifter and mm-hmm. without a doubt. And that seems to be the sole source of the autism from vaccine mm-hmm. story. Right. And so, like, I mean, there's a lot of angles on all that's terrible. The main one that I come from is like a disability justice one that is like... So, okay, so let's say it did cause autism. Like, who cares? Autism is fine. People with autism are awesome. 
but there's also the aspect that it's just flat out wrong. Right. Um, and there's zero evidence for it. But um, but because of myths like that and fears that are understandable because people get scared about putting foreign substances in their own and their children's bodies, I get that. Um, and people don't like when their children cry, which is the thing what happens when you get a vaccine and you're a baby. But um, But because of that, there's enough people who do not get the MMR vaccine that at this point we do not have in some communities herd immunity to measles, which is an incredibly infectious disease, um, far more infectious even than coronavirus. And so we end up having these outbreaks of a disease that otherwise just does not exist in areas which are vaccinated. Um, and so really, and the amount that you need of vaccination for any given dis- different disease depends on Um, how infectious that disease is. For example, the flu is less infectious than coronavirus. So you need fewer people to get the flu vaccine in order for to achieve herd immunity than you do have a coronavirus vaccine. Um, The vaccine itself is less effective in part because of the genetic makeup of flu. Um, But also we still wish that we had more people getting vaccinated against flu because flu kills thousands of people a year. Um, Coronavirus, we need a very effective vaccine and we need a lot of people to get it. Thankfully, it appears we have a couple of very effective vaccines in the works and that will soon be available to people in the United States and are already available to people in the United Kingdom and hopefully will be soon available to people around the world. Um, But we're also going to need a lot of people to get that vaccine in order to protect everybody. Because until we get to that point, we'll just be kind of protecting ourselves and our friends and family, which is huge and important but we will not be at enough of a point to, to um, create herd immunity, which is really what we need in order to protect the most vulnerable people in our communities um, who may not have access to healthcare systems, who may have experienced historical and ongoing lived oppression and feel unsafe around doctors, um, who may be physically unable to develop immunity, whether because of an immunocompromised condition or because of some other contraindication. Um, so I think that the real, like sometimes people um, I come to the position and one of the big things, like misinformation things that was passed around this year about herd immunity was like, oh, well, we'll just get let enough people get sick to develop herd immunity. And that's wrong on a couple counts. One, because getting sick with a mitre case of coronavirus does not seem to always have been enough to develop per- persistent immunity. Hmm. Second, it means that we're losing between one and three percent of people, like as in they die because they were getting that coronavirus on the on a um, and majority like people who are older people with chronic health issues so it that that at that point we're talking about like a eugenics argument which to me is also ethically unacceptable so really the only way that we could possibly achieve herd immunity to a disease that's infectious is to vaccinate a majority of people um thankfully there's a positive feedback loop because the more people that are vaccinated the more people are protected um, so it's not like it's only helpful once the most people are vaccinated. It's always going to be helpful to the per- to the persons and the communities who are most vaccinated. That said, um, in order to really reach that point of our herd immunity of protecting the majority of people, we'll have to vaccinate the majority of people. Do you, do you have an idea like 75 percent, 80 percent or? Um. I have looked at the data. I don't remember it off the top of my head. I didn't really do a whole lot of preparation, to be honest, for our talk today. Oh, that's I okay. <laughs> um, I believe that what it, so it, it is proportionate. It's kind of the inverse of the r not, which is the concept of the number of people that a single person can can cause illness in. This disease, it appears to be somewhere between one and three. It depends on a lot of different social factors, as well as different factors of different strains of this virus. Um, it does appear that we need to get most, um, I think that what I was seeing was something like 70% possibly, but I, I could be wrong. So I don't want to roll with that. Uh, what I will say is, is that, um, there's also a strong, it's not just a like, well, we'll just wait and see thing. Like there is a potential for an opportunity cost if not enough people get vaccinated. Because the other thing to remember is, is that viruses are not stable things. Um, they're even more heavily mutagenic or frequently changing things than our bacteria, which are also very mutagenic. So there is a risk, just like there's a risk that we can develop antibiotic resistance if we don't get enough of a bac- of an antibiotic in order to completely eliminate infection. There is a possible risk that if um, 
this disease goes on long enough that whatever virus was not eliminated by a widespread vaccination campaign that that virus could evolve and develop a resistance to or like change in a way that the vaccine might be less effective. So um, I would say that's probably, I mean, I don't know, there's so few things that feel stable and reliable in this world this year. Um, But I think that um, that's one of the biggest risks about not enough people getting a vaccine, aside from just them themselves or their family members or loved ones or their friends' friends' loved ones dying is that um, there is a potential, if not enough people get vaccinated, that the vaccine might be less effective. Um, Still not a reason to not get the vaccine. It's just a reason that we need to get more people to get vaccinated, if that makes sense. Right. No, it it totally does. And, and, you know, you've you've mentioned for very good reason, uh, uh, you know, people dying. But obviously, um, we are already seeing that there's many people who don't die of this virus, uh, but who are having long term you know, or apparent long-term oh, effects, you know, that are very serious. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people who, um, there, again, there's nothing wrong with disability. People who have disabilities are awesome and very capable in many ways. And there are a lot of people who will experience unnecessary disability because they got infected with a preventable illness that had enduring and long-term effects, oftentimes through none of their own choice or actions, sometimes through some of their own actions. Um, and again, all the people who've been heavily and negatively impacted, um, very disproportionately black and Latinx folks in the state of Oregon, particularly the vast majority of my patients with coronavirus, um, have been, uh, Latinx folks. Um, and I mean, that's, that's shifting now. There's more, I have more white folks. I've had people taking hydroxychloroquine, um, presumably because uh, the president told them to. Um, getting coronavirus and coming in, um, it's it's affecting a broader subset of the community, but um, but there's a lot of communities that are going to be that have been vastly and disproportionately affected by coronavirus, and they are many of the same eff- communities that are underserved by healthcare industry in general, and that disproportionately experience violence from other corners as well, such as Black and Latinx folks and Indigenous folks. So. Um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of, there's a lot of layers of, uh, of harm and sadness. And I, I think that what you were saying before about the, 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 the challenges of having a loved one in the hospital, that, that is, to be honest, one of the saddest things is, um, when I worked in the ICU is, is I would work with people who are oftentimes like, there's plenty of people who make it into the ICU with coronavirus who make it out. Um, and I don't want to spell a doom and gloom image. Because the, my colleagues who work in the ICUs work very hard to keep people alive, but there's plenty of people who you just they get in there and it's just you just know that they, they have very little chance of surviving, and it's like such a hard thing to 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 like be on the phone with a family member who can't see their loved one that last time because they're dying from coronavirus in an ICU, um, and that's like one of my biggest fears that someone I care about will end up in the ICU because I made them sick. Um, and I hope that if anything out of this conversation, that anyone listening can have that fear put into them and do whatever they can to keep themselves and, the, and their people safe. That's great. I, I really appreciate this conversation. Um, it's been really awesome to talk to you. I, we've also we've gone over, um, you know, how long <laughs> we said we'd talk, uh, which is always great. Uh, but I, I just want to yeah, give cool. you the opportunity. Oh. I want to give you the opportunity here to, to, to wrap it up and sort of give a final a final mm-hmm. message, you know. I mean, I, I feel like that's kind of it really is like, um, I mean, there's a lot of hope and this is a moment of hope, but there's, is also a moment of a lot of fear. Like, like this winter is kind of, it's no longer just like waiting indefinitely. It's like, keep yourself and your people alive long enough so that you can get vaccinated so that y'all can be more or less safe. Um, and so like the choices that we make, this lonely, sad winter um, have really, really like even more severe repercussions than any of the choices that you've made thus far over this last pretty darn hard year. Um, And yeah, don't come visit me in the ICU or any of my colleagues in the ICU. Stay well as much as possible. Keep your people safe. Um, Practice harm reduction because nobody can be perfect. 
um, have serious conversations with your household, with your friends, with your family, with your lovers, uh, with the other people you interact with, your coworkers, about the things that you are able to and not able to do for safety. Um, and then, and then do, do those things. Um, take time to look after yourself, to lean on the coping mechanisms that you have in order to survive in a world where maybe you're having less touch or less interpersonal connection than you would like. If you're one of those special, like really, really solid introverted people who are like just happy being alone, like God bless you. I've never been more jealous. Um, and if you're like me and hungering for the day when you can go to dance parties and kiss strangers, um, I feel you. It's just not quite that time yet. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.